leave the floor to Mr. Celadolo, President of Forcopi, for the welcome. Buongiorno, benvenuti a tutti. Per me è davvero un piacere darvi il benvenuto a un incontro così importante che pensiamo andrà a diventare una pietra miliare nel lavoro quotidiano di tutti quelli che operano nel settore dell'intervento umanitario. E sappiamo già tutti dai dati di, di HCR quale sia la dimensione del problema. Si calcola a 59 milioni e mezzo di persone nel corso del 2014 rifugiate o scollate interne, quindi costrette a vivere in condizioni assolutamente disumane, con un incremento di, 8, di più di 8 milioni rispetto all'anno precedente. Quindi davvero è un'emergenza globale, un'emergenza che di, 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 di anno in anno sembra diventare sempre più importante. I coppi conosciamo bene com'è la situazione di vita nei campi di rifugiati. I rifugiati arrivano in genere con poco più di quello che hanno addosso, eventualmente un pacchetto in testa con poche cose e sono davvero in situazioni fisiche e anche psicologiche estremamente, estremamente vulnerabili, incapaci di, di accudire a se stesse e quindi è evidente che di fronte a situazioni così estreme chiunque è impegnato nell'aiuto umanitario si indirizza a quelli che sono assolutamente i bisogni di base, eh, cibo, una tenda, eh, water and sanitation, un minimo di, di salute globale di base eh, e, e niente più. Diciamo che a Coppi conosciamo bene questa situazione perché praticamente è dal 1981 che Coppi lavora strettamente a contatto con questa problematica. La nostra prima esperienza è stata con la guerra di Rogaden appunto dell'81 in Somalia e praticamente da allora non abbiamo mai più cessato di operare in questo settore umanitario. E tra l'altro... Per noi, per la, per la nostra fondazione è stato anche un momento cruciale perché ha significato il passaggio da un'associazione dedicata soprattutto al lavoro con, con organizzazioni missionarie a un'associazione un fortemente eh, professionalizzata. Di conseguenza, conoscendo bene questo stato di situazione, sappiamo come ci sia bisogno di andare di là di quello che sono proprio i, i, i bisogni di base, di trovare delle alternative serie e credibili per migliorare davvero lo stato di benessere di chi si trova in queste situazioni estremamente, estremamente eh, svantaggiate. Per questo che crediamo che sia molto importante un convegno come quello di oggi che va a esplorare la possibilità di utilizzare le nuove tecnologie, soprattutto nel campo dell'energia dell sostenibile, eh, per il, la conservazione, l'utilizzo e il miglioramento della qualità della nutrizione all'interno dei campi di rifugiati. Eh, in questo, in un progetto che vi, vi presenteranno loro, il, i, i protagonisti, eh, tra poco, eh, come vedrete la parte di ricerca è assolutamente fondamentale e quindi proprio perché c'è una parte di ricerca così importante è assolutamente cruciale la collaborazione che fin dall'inizio si è installata col Politecnico di Milano e con la Fondazione Politecnico. Brevemente, brevemente lasciatemi solo ringraziare appunto il... Eh, la Direzione Generale per lo Sviluppo del Ministero degli Affari Esteri e la Cooperazione Internazionale che ci ha fortemente appoggiato nell'organizzazione della giornata di oggi e, beh, e soprattutto gli amici di ECO con cui si lavora a strettissimo contatto per cercare di ottenere dei risultati significativi in questo, in questo campo. Davvero ringrazio tutti eh, quelli che parteciperanno a questo incontro, buon lavoro a tutti e cedo la parola a chi davvero entrerà nel, nel nel, nel concreto del problema. Grazie. So, okay, now the first session is starting from the energy nexus in EU material. Allora, iniziamo subito con la prima sessione. Good morning. Hola, hola, Ibrahim Saif, uh, representative from uh, the uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy. Uh, dear colleagues and partners from Cooperazione Internazionale, Politecnico di Milano, Fondazione, and uh, all of you, thank you for being here. It's uh, for me a pleasure uh, to, uh, to be here and represent <coughs> the uh, European Commission 
which uh, finds deep interest in uh, this subject, as you may imagine. Um, I'm working uh, for the um, uh, DG ECO, which is uh, the uh, Director General of the uh, European Commission uh, dealing with the humanitarian assistance and uh, civil protection, particularly with the thematic policy unit called A4. Sounds a little bit like uh, uh, the superhero uh, things. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like that, but we are not. We uh, deal, deal it particularly with the development of the key policies and guidance that uh, we wish to see implemented in, a, in a, uh, humanitarian interventions. I would like to just go quickly with you on uh, the history of the humanitarian food assistance policy. Can we go to the next? Oh, yeah, right, thanks. In uh, 2010, we uh, adopted the communication and uh, then later on policies accompanied by the staff working document of the humanitarian food, food assistance. This is one uh, of uh, our key policies within DG ECO that has been uh, uh, developed with the support from uh, our field staff, with uh, our partners on the ground, and uh, like all of our policy at the commissions, are coming from the bottom, from uh, those that are really on the field and experience the needs, and brings up what are the real needs that have to be taken into account. And we think that it's a particularly good policy that, uh, by the way, has been uh, adopted and uh, directly, entirely, or partially by many other donor institutions. Why it's so important? If you have a look to this uh, graph, these, uh, these maps, you will see what was in 2014 a location of funds from uh, DG ECO to uh, the various uh, food assistance and nutrition intervention worldwide. Well, the blue one is the humanitarian food assistance, the, and the green is the nutrition. You can see the typical country where we work more in terms of magnitude. What is interesting is the big chart on the top of Australia. We're not operating in Australia, fortunately, uh, for Australia, of course. We, uh, you, you can see that overall, more than 36% of our funds goes in food assistance and nutrition. What is the principal objective of uh, our policy? Well, we are humanitarian, so we don't work very much in developments. It's really to save and preserve life, to protect livelihood, to increase resilience, and to work in the context of food crisis. This is the principal objective. We have three specific objectives in our policies. The first one is to safeguard the availability, the access, and the consumption of adequate, safe, and nutrition food for population affected or that may be affected by uh, ongoing or recent humanitarian crisis. This is a specific objective number one. The second one is to protect livelihood. Well, here we go probably closer to uh, development action, but we remain in the context of uh, assisting those beneficiaries whose livelihood may be affected or have been affected by a humanitarian crisis. A third one is linked to strengthen the capacity, the capacity of uh, all the humanitarian actors to tackle and to address humanitarian needs in the more efficient and effective way. Uh, just, just, this is just a, a a map showing the integrated food security phase classification, uh, which uh, it's uh, um, uh, 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 something that has been supported by, by, by ECO, uh, an idea from FAO, that uh, enabled to give a common language, a common way to classify, cl classify um, food, food crisis. So this is just an, just an example of uh, uh, enhancing the capacity of our partners. When the Commission enter in the game with uh, this policy? Well, the Commission can trigger humanitarian food assistance when we have uh, emergency rates of mortality or acute malnutrition that uh, 
may uh, uh, deteriorate when they are above a certain threshold. And when the compromised livelihood or, or extreme coping strategy pose or can pose the risk for the affected population in a determining the humanitarian crisis. So as you can see, we don't intervene in any context. We really focus on uh, emergency response with our partners. Within the policy, we have uh, what we call a toolbox. Basically, it's explaining what we do and what we cannot do. And uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the nature of the food, uh, food security, some of you will know that the food security basically has three pillars, food availability, food access, food utilization. We need the three of them to ensure proper food security. What is our policy saying about uh, food availability? Well, there, are, there is a variety of tools and things that uh, we can do and that we support with our partners, like uh, provision of uh, in-kind uh, um, foods or inputs, livestock, the, the best stocking, restocking, veterinary care, input distribution, training, and so many others. By the way, I'm here also to invite all of you to read and to use our policy because you have, not only in the body but also in the annexes, a comprehensive, a very interesting list of uh, the, the, uh, the way we approach uh, food availability, access, and utilization. What about food access? Well, food access is, a uh, problem with food access is when, for instance, uh, food is available in the local market, but people, they don't have the resources to purchase it. In this case, as uh, many of you already know, DG Eco was one of the big pushers for the using and increasing use of uh, cash-based intervention. Basically, we don't want to give food baskets to people that uh, uh, are in need, but where the problem is only the access. The market is full of food, just that they cannot buy it. It's better to give them the net necessary resources in terms of cash in order to purchase. Of course, taking into account the, the needs not to, uh, to, not, not to create a damage to the market, of course. Providing livelihood support, market support as well, etc. But what about food utilization? Well, we realized that uh, we need to uh, be clear when we talk about food utilization. We talk about two dimensions of food utilization. is how the food is physically handled uh, at different level process, from the beginning to the end, and how the food is utilized by the body, body metabolized. So we're talking about food processing, like milling, preparation, cooking, storing, transportation, retails, intra-household use and distribution of food. But uh, we talk also about food utilization when we refer to uh, feeding practices, like how bold and promote favorable infant-child feeding practices and breastfeeding, for instance. Access to safe water. Try to make pasta without water. Well, the same things apply in other contexts. You cannot just talk about food. You need to have the necessary a source of, an, um, uh, uh, of safe water in order to ensure food security and access to the health system. Well, in 2013, there have been an external evaluation. The Commission does that often to make an external evaluation of its own work to see uh, to which extent our policy was uh, properly adopted, rolled out by ourselves and by our partners. What this evaluation came up, this evaluation is available on the website that, um, by the way, it's, um, you, the link are the, at the end of the, um, in the presentation. It shows that we have done probably more in food availability and food access than what we should and we could have done in food utilization. And the uh, evaluation came with some recommendation, like uh, one, we should do more, we should promote more activities with our partners to implement and to take into account the need of food utilization, like the one mentioned before. And we should promote capacity building initiatives that made our partners, but not only our partners, also the entire humanitarian community to do so. And particularly, 
they mentioned the importance of the energy, the energy needs of our humanitarian beneficiaries. Possibly taking into account the new stuff that came out in the last decades in terms of uh, innovative technology. Because, let's say the truth, sometimes humanitarian are seen by researchers and innovators like a little bit the dinosaur in the room that uh, just uh, stick to uh, the uh, old uh, approach and they're not very much open to innovation. Well, we think that it's important to change a little bit and actually this is changing. So how to do so? How do we decide to, uh, to take on board this recommendation? And uh, DigiEco has uh, a special funds called the uh, ERC, Enhanced Response Capacity. And uh, we wished to have partners apply for these funds that were taking into account uh, those needs. Among them, one, and this is the reason we are here today, is the one led by the Cooperazione Inter Internazionale with the Politecnico di Milano and Fondazione Politecnico. And uh, the purpose of this ERC is really to develop tools and to bring a fresh air, a new capacity yeah, at, um, in the humanitarian context. Possibly involve uh, other research and academic institutions in order to roll out and to prepare, better prepare future humanitarian workers. This uh, comes from another evaluation, external evaluation, that says that, well, yeah, ECHO, compared to other director general, could do better, could do more by involving research and uh, academic institutes. So we, think, we thought that this was a good way. And encouraging our partners in our core proposal, uh, call it this way, humanitarian implement, implementation plan, to take in the due account full, full utilization when they apply for funds to ECHO, in order to create a positive cycle. So we thank you very much to be, you to be here, because uh, it's part of this uh, initiative. And uh, with this, uh, I leave the floor to uh, uh, my colleague, Professor Essa Emanuela Colombo. Honorable guest, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome also from Politecnico di Milano side. Can you give me the, thank you? Okay. Um, so uh, after the speech of uh, Alexander was uh, very much focused on food, uh, we as Politecnico di Milano, we will jump a bit on energy and probably later on Marco will couple all of them in order to respect the assignment that we have received for this session. Um, before uh, doing that, my presentation is divided into three small parts. The first one is a sh short, sh short presentation of Politecnico di Milano and why Politecnico di Milano uh, is involved in this uh, uh, very important adventure. The second one is uh, a focus on energy, development and right, and how these three elements are connected together. And the third one is a list of uh, some golden, golden rules that we have learned from the experience, either working together with uh, COPI and Fondazione Politecnico, and either from our experience in uh, uh, access to energy in the rural area in developing countries. So first of all, why Politecnico di Milano is uh, sitting down today uh, with, with all of you. Uh, Politecnico di Milano, for those who, know of, uh, who are not familiar with, with the HIT, Politecnico di Milano is a public state university founded, founded in 1863 in cooperation, in strong cooperation with the local uh, industrial environment. We are, ma we are a technical university, a so-called technical university, deeply involved in engineering, architecture and industrial design. And as you may see, our logo, our, uh, our, I mean our, our mission is uh, to try to couple technology with culture and creativity. Mm, we are very much focused, as almost all the technical university, on teaching, research, and then the technology transfer. And we think that technology transfer, or better, technological cooperation is very, import, very much important because it is the way in which we try to prove the effectiveness of our teaching and research. If we are not able to provide something back to the society, I think our teaching and research are a little bit on the moon. This is a way why we consider the third element very important. But our mission needs to be shaped to tackle the new 
challenges of development. And as we can see, the, the main challenges of development are now changing. We are moving very, very much uh, updated to today. We are moving from the eight millennium development goals, which have been considered somehow the, the, the mainstream of development since 2000, to the sustainable development paradigm, which is a new strategy for an inclusive growth within the post-2015 agenda. It's a, it's a very important strategy which will try to match the economic development with the environmental preservation, but also with social inclusion and good governance. And within this paradigm, energy has a big, big, big role to play. So what is the link between energy, development and rights? Um, here I have plotted a couple of graphs. Uh, they may be easily understand because uh, if you look at uh, the uh, one above, uh, you have the connection between, uh, let me check, okay, between the gross national income per capita of the different countries. The, the blue dots are the different countries at the worldwide level. And here on the other axis, we have the electricity energy consumption. And as we can easily see from this graph, below a certain threshold, which is this one, the link, this one, with, be, the link between uh, the gross national income and the electricity availability is very important, which say again that energy is really fundamental, really critical if you want to develop uh, a, a country from the economic point of view. But the link is not only a link between energy and the economic development, but we have also a link which goes beyond the economic dimension. And indeed, in the second graph below, again, the dots are uh, the, the, the developing countries in this uh, specific graph. We try to link the human development index with the energy development index. Both of these indicators have been, let's say, set up by the UN system a few years ago. Uh, the, UN, the human development index, I think, is very well known by all of you. So again, we can see that the availability of energy is somehow very much related to the human development of the specific country. So energy is not only linked to the economic dimension, but to the, but to the complexity of and the multidimensionality of development. But, uh, so if it is like this, uh, energy should be a right for everybody. But which kind of right are we speaking about? Energy is not a fundamental right because uh, our dignity is not, uh, let's say, it's not under threat if we, are, if we do not have enough energy. But energy is for sure considered today as an instrumental right, which means that if we have uh, zero or very few access to energy, it's very much difficult to grant, to guarantee the fundamental rights. We cannot have access to education, we cannot have access to safe food, we cannot have access to healthcare and so on. So this is uh, uh, what we say when we uh, uh, consider that energy is an instrumental right for all. But uh, a right to what? If we look at the energy, the so-called energy ladder, which goes from the primary needs up to the, uh, let's say, the uh, so-called public services uh, and goods and to the productive use of energy, we may not forget that energy all along this change is every time linked to water management, to food safety and security, to agriculture and to the so-called rural industry. So there is a deep link between energy and uh, a lot of other resources that are so fundamental for the good quality of life of the people. And often, as we uh, all know, those who are affected by an issue of energy poverty are experiences are experiencing also some other problem related to uh, uh, poor access to basic health care or poor access to fresh water or to basic education, and uh, most of them suffer from chronic malnutrition. So there is a deep link between energy, food, and water. Um, as we were saying, energy should be a right for all if there is this deep link between energy and development, but this is not the case. Uh, not only because the people do not have enough access, which is an issue of quality, but also because the people do not have the right quality of the access to energy. As uh, uh, Alex was saying, there is an issue of affordability sometimes. Energy needs to be affordable. The people need to have energy, but they need to be able to pay this energy. Energy needs to be uh, safe and need to be clean as far as it is possible. Uh, but uh, here are some numbers that are probably mostly known by you. In low-income countries, we had more or less 1 or 3 billion of people without access to electricity. The majority of them lives in the rural areas. And also we have 2.6 billion of people which still today rely on non-commercial biomass, which means uh, wood or charcoal, which are 
uh, still today burned into inefficient devices such as the tree stone fires and so but also there is an issue which regards middle income economies and we are, where we have one billion people which uh, may, they have access to, uh, to electricity but they do not have access to a reliable electric energy which is not much a problem for those who live in the household but it is really a problem in case we want to run a, a, a small industry. Our production, our daily production is very much affected by the lack of, uh, uh, of energy and in some of these countries we are speaking about 30 to 50 days per year in which we do not have access to electricity. This means a, a very low, um, sorry, a very high impact on the sales of the small medium enterprises. But uh, last but not least, and this is something uh, I would like to stress again and again, is that also in high income countries we start having a problem of uh, access to uh, energy poverty in Europe, in the so-called developed Europe, we have between 50 to 75 millions of uh, European people affected by a problem of uh, energy poverty, which means that they probably have the sockets and the uh, air conditioning system or the heating system, but they cannot afford it. Due to the economic crisis, due to the immigration, there are a number of group of people which are really struggled by this problem and the number, unfortunately, is growing. This is again saying to us that we are living in a single world and we do need to share a common solution for the benefit of all. Um, so, uh, the, issue is, uh, the, the issue of uh, access to energy is uh, um, very much interesting in developing countries and with special reference to the sub-Saharan Africa, where the majority of uh, the camps, as we have seen also by, uh, by the, the, the picture shown to us by Alex a few minutes ago, is, uh, is present. So the issue of access to energy has two phases. One is access to electric energy and the other one is access to modern energy services. We have some conditions that are very much similar in the refugee camps and in the rural area of sub-Saharan Africa. We are more or less speaking of off-grid area in poor economic condition. We have also such, some social cultural constraints which are very much important and uh, we, we, we will listen this afternoon by some of the, to, to some of the, the colleagues speaking of the innovation that we have introduced and they are more or less process innovation rather than product innovation which try to respond to this social and cultural constraint. And also we have an issue of environmental pressure that the refugee camps exert on the, on the country where they are hosted. But also we have other additional ele elements. We are living in emergency condition and uh, uh, we have a lack of trust among the people while in, in the rural villages of, uh, of uh, some uh, developing countries you have a trust among the people which is a very important element which we don't have in this situation and also we have a number of concurrent urgency that need to be sold together. Access to energy uh, has two phases but no single solution and what we have experienced in working on this project is um, let's say a, a shift of the perspective because coming from the rural area of developing countries as our experience is, um, is at first we have seen that in this situation there is a first the, the, the main attention is given to electrification. First of all people want to be electrified. Why? So the, this is the experience coming from, uh, you know, from the rural area of developing countries but but here in, in the situation of the refugee camps we have experienced that the, the first, the very important element, the much more important than the other is uh, modern energy, uh, the access to modern energy services, the issue of food cooking, food preservation and water sanitation and as Alex was saying, they are much more relevant because they are really linked to the daily life of, of the people. Uh, some of the technology that we uh, have introduced, but you will listen to them in this afternoon. We are working a lot on improved cook stoves in order to do two, uh, to achieve two goals. The first one is to reduce the, uh, let's say, the use of uh, wood and charcoal thus reducing the pressure that the refugee camps may have on, on, the, on the country uh, where it is hosted and also in the same time to reduce the, um, let's say, the emission of uh, uh, pollutants that may damage the health of the people. And from the other side we are trying to, from the electric, electric energy side, we are trying to promote a hybrid system which try to combine, uh, combine a number of renewable energies in order to get electricity to the people uh, safe, affordable and clean. Um, so, what we have learned from our experience uh, both in, in uh, 
uh, ten, 10 years of, uh, let's say, activity in developing countries uh, in the rural area and also uh, thanks to the experience that we have shared with COPI and uh, with the Fondazione Politecnico. Uh, I, I call them the three golden rules. They are very simple. First one, uh, we need to promote people and need centered action. Uh, the technological innovation that we want to achieve need to be driven by the need of the people, full stop. Very, it seems very simple, but it is very clear. Uh, all along the, uh, the, the, the energy ladder that I have shown to you, we have always to remind that the final goal is uh, uh, to uh, obtain and to achieve uh, sustainable development for the local people, which means that we are not much interested in how many kilowatt hour or kilowatt hour, kilojoule we, we, we get to the people, we provide to the people, but we are much more interested in, in how these kilowatt hour are transformed into development. And, th and this is a change of perspective also for us. Uh, we come from the engineering field, so we are very technical, but we feel that if we want to achieve a sustainable solution in these places, we really need to change our perspective. So we are working a lot on uh, new planning and evaluation methodologies. Maybe some of them we will discuss this afternoon. The second element is do not work alone, do not work alone uh, which means that the issue is so complex uh, and so, uh, I mean, it, it presents so many perspectives that we need really to join uh, other uh, players. Not only from a, uh, let's say, multi-stakeholder partnership, so that we need to work with the governmental institution, private sector, international organizations, civil society, and so on, but also we need to share our engineering experience with others, and so if we want really to plan a good and sustainable solution, we must we should be able to match our engineering experience with that of the social scientists, with that of the economists, with that of policy makers, and also with that of the educators. So this is the only way if we really want to solve this big issue. And the last is uh, uh, we need innovation, innovation, and innovation. But which kind of innovation we need? Either if we speak of technology or business model or enabling policy. We need a creative innovation, which needs to be much more focused on at the local level. It must be promoted at local level. The, the innovation that I call native innovation or indigenous innovation. But for doing that, we need a lot of qualified education and we need high level scientific research at the local level. This is the, uh, the only way if we really want to transform the imported innovation into something that is able to be sustained at local level. So capacity building is for us a very crucial element. And it is the only way for transforming the so-called technology transfer, which I don't like as a word because it's a monodirectional uh, uh, you know, path into a technological cooperation, which means that we can learn a lot. We as developed country, we can work a lot, uh, we can learn a lot by working with, uh, uh, with developing countries, by working in critical situations such as those of, uh, uh, of the refugee camps, uh, and we can set up a system of mutual learning that can have a lot of benefit at global level. So I'm just at the end, just to mention again that even if we are engineers, so we should be uh, technology driven, we feel that energy is only an instrument. And behind energy, we cannot forget that we have the need of the people and the people themselves. And so our technological solution needs to be designed in order to satisfy this need. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Emanuela. I give the floor to Marco Ciapparelli, copy. Yeah, hello everybody. Once again, thank you very much for your participation. Well, we are already in delay, so I'll be as brief as possible. But before starting my brief presentation, let me share with all of you my personal pleasure for uh, being here representing on one side COPI, Cooperazione Internazionale, the Italian NGO I've been working with, uh, and on the other side the CEF for Food, being the Sustainable Energy Technologies for Food Utilization Partnership, uh, which is the project I've been uh, coordinating on behalf of COPI, in the framework of which this uh, workshop has been thought and, uh, and put in place. So, today my presentation will uh, briefly explore three main uh, issues. The first one is represented by the so-called energy insecurity, whereas the second one is represented by, let's say, a quick overview on some uh, 
of the most relevant negative impacts of the very same energy insecurity in humanitarian terms, whereas the third one is represented by how energy for food, and more specifically energy for food utilization, is currently provided in humanitarian crisis context, and I could be ensured in a more efficient and sustainable way. So let's start from uh, energy insecurity. First of all, a couple of figures already highlighted by Professor Colombo. So currently, one third of the world population has no access to electricity, and around half of the world population relies on traditional biomass and cook over rudimentary open fires. It's pretty clear that the lack of energy has a number of ne negative impacts on the vast majority of human daily activities, such as cooking, heating, water pumping, refrigeration, not only food, but for example also vaccines or other uh, crucial items. Uh, and we had other different examples such as uh, health activities. Uh, in this case, the better the energy availability, the higher the number of operation hours, uh, or we had the income generating activities. In this case, the better the energy availability, the, let's say, higher the productivity of an average economic activity. And finally, we had the so-called gender issues. So in this case, the better the energy availability, the lower the number of hours, generally speaking, spent by women or children in collecting firewood, fetching water, and, uh, and so on. So according to the International Energy Agency, by 2030, the energy demand will rise by over 50 percent. Uh, let's say one of the most uh, worrying factors is represented by the fact that fossil fuels uh, will account for more than 80 percent uh, of this projected increase. Basically, the vast majority of people suffering from uh, energy insecurity currently live in developing countries or in countries affected by crisis, uh, both uh, natural disasters or uh, man-made crises. So we are talking about areas where there are uh, huge lacks uh, both uh, in infrastructures and in financial resources uh, hindering the development of alternative energy sources. Given that, uh, we have two major consequences. The first one is that the imbalance in supply and demand uh, may induce a price spike, uh, making fossil fuels costly and accessible. The second one is that without the development of alternative energy sources to meet growing demand, developing, developing and vulnerable populations may find their fuel needs increasingly unmet. So the question is, uh, which are the main consequences of this uh, energy insecurity in uh, humanitarian terms? So according to our perceptions, there are basically two different levels. The first one is represented by the so-called impact on vulnerability and the need for humanitarian assistance. And more specifically, an increased number of people in need and a higher vulnerability degree of those people already receiving assistance whose living condition due to, let's say, the lack of energy sources will get worse. Second level is the impact on the implementation of humanitarian operations. And more specifically, it means a sort of scale up of operations and more funds needed. Well, nowadays, the reach, the mobility, or the timely deployment of humanitarian assistance are, uh, let's say, heavily fuel dependent. So if the fuel cost goes up, uh, the humanitarian operations will be more expensive, and so national and international actors such as uh, NGOs uh, will be compelled uh, to look for more funds. And then uh, we had to, let's say, identify new approaches uh, to be designed uh, and implemented on the ground. So let's have a look to the so-called nexus between food and energy access uh, in humanitarian crisis. So in the very aftermath of a humanitarian crisis, the sole priority is surely represented by saving lives. 
And this means, among the others, supporting the affected population by providing food and water without any questioning about its sustainability. But if we focus our attention on food, such approach during the last three, four decades caused and still causes remarkable negative, unfortunately, impacts. We have different, I mean, examples. Uh, one of the most relevant ones uh, is surely represented by the Great Lake Crisis uh, in 1994. Uh, due to the Rwandan genocide, around 2 million people left their home, uh, being hosted in what is currently called the Democratic Republic of Congo, former Zaire, and among the other countries, uh, Tanzania. Just to give you an example, in the northwestern part of Tanzania, there was, there, there was a very small village, Benaco, which turned itself uh, in the second largest city in the country, having hosted more than 500,000 people in four different refugee camps. So it's pretty clear the humanitarian community was there. Uh, a number of activities were put in place, for example, food provision, at a certain point, the refugees were, uh, in a way, compelled to look for uh, firewood in order to cook this food. And so, after six months, uh, and uh, five kilometers far from those four uh, refugee camps, uh, all the trees had been cut down. And in one year, uh, in 10 kilometers far from these four refugee camps, all the trees had been cut down. So, I mean, the negative impacts on environment was uh, pretty striking. And once a humanitarian crisis became, as in the vast majority of cases, a protracted one, uh, humanitarian approaches to change, ensuring that's clear, a sufficient, safe, and nutrition, food availability and utilization, but making it more efficient and sustainable. So in this case, the question is how to make food utilization and more specifically food cooking more efficient and sustainable in the long run. We said, okay, we were in 1994, so some, uh, I mean, some year passed away, and in the last three decades, uh, we had a number of uh, different programs promoted by national and international actors uh, such as, for example, the provision of firewood and at the same time the planting of trees uh, fit for the specific purpose uh, or the production the marketing of non foody biomass briquettes made by, I don't know, uh, grass or leaves, etc., etc., or uh, a number of trainings on, uh, let's say, fuel-saving technologies Finally, oops. Okay. Finally, there has been the provision or the production or and the marketing too of a number of tools such as uh, improved cookstoves uh, rather than uh, solar cookers uh, rather than other tools. Uh, we will discuss them in the afternoon. Uh, which are uh, some of those technologies tested by the CEPHOFU project. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention.